Ready? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the introduction to the topic. Um, I'm Alexander Sidorbrenik from Eindhoven University of Technology, and of course, I'm very, very glad to say that Eleni, who is here present, will be joining us shortly. Tom, thank you very much for doing such a wonderful job with preparing Eleni for her next steps. Um, <laughs> Thanks for continuing with the next steps. <laughs> well, this is what we're going to see later. Right? <laughs> so the topic of my talk is uh, gender and GitHub. Uh, and the reason why we're actually looking at gender and at collaborative aspects of software development in general is because software development is, of course, a collaborative activity. And in a way, it is not so different from the harvest which you have seen, which we see here on the uh, engraving for uh, Nicholas Peterson Berg. Uh, it's um, we see people of different genders working on collaboratively on achieving a shared goal. So the shared goal here is of course harvest, the shared goal in our case is creation of software, but in any case people need to collaborate. Uh, just to give you some empirical data, because as an empirical researcher I believe in uh, this kind of data. Uh, this is a study, this is actually a survey study by uh, Nachi Nagarpan and Tom Ball on evidence-based failure prediction. So this, what they try to <coughs> predict uh, post-release defects uh, in um, Windows components, uh, Windows Server components, uh, based on all kinds of metrics related to the amount of change in uh, source code related to complexity of the source code and so on and so forth. And you see that the best prediction has been obtained based on metrics which are related to collaboration, which are actually related to the organizational structure, things like um, how many engineers do we have working on this component, how many of those engineers are no longer employed, uh, how are those engineers distributed over the organization and so on and so forth. So when we are talking about um, social aspects, about diversity, we usually work on four different levels of variables. So we talk about individual aspects. <coughs> Today I'm going to talk about gender. I have currently a student who is looking at age. Uh, there is quite some work uh, on uh, cultural aspects. We also looked at tenure, which tenure here should be understood as the amount of time a contributor is involved in a project. Uh, then we can move to team level variables, and those variables are typical diversity variables, uh, like tenure diversity, gender diversity, cultural diversity, and so on and so on, because of course diversity is not meaningful if you do not dis uh, describe the context of this diversity. In our case, those are teams. And we want to understand how those variables impact software development process and software development result of this process, essentially processes. So software development process you can think about productivity, you can think about uh, communication. So below we see an example of so-called community smell. So community smells have been introduced by Damien and Tamburi uh, as examples of suboptimal communication within a group. You can also think about turnover, which is uh, related to the amount of uh, people who are leaving and joining project from one time to another uh, window to another time window. And finally, we can take uh, products. So here I'm just showing one example, the pod smell log method. But equally well, we could have looked at uh, complexity matrix change and so on and so on. So, a priori, it is not clear whether diversity should be good or bad. So on the one hand, if you look at the uh, literature on uh, collaboration and teamwork, we see that people prefer to work together with other people with whom they share their values and attitudes. And this is very logical because if we all share the same values and attitudes and beliefs, then we don't need to waste time arguing what is important, what is not important and why, because we all share those. It's easier to collaborate with someone who is similar to us. Uh, moreover, people tend to compartmentalize. Sometimes this comes to from outside, from the way the uh, groups are organized. Sometimes people like to do it themselves. 
when I'm teaching in I Poland at our master program, we typically have three kinds of students. We have students who got their bachelor degree in I Poland itself. We have students who are coming from polytechnical schools in the Netherlands and then going through a free master program to join the master program, and we have international so if I do not pay special attention to composing teams in my course, then students who got their bachelor in high school will be working with students who got their bachelor in high school. Those from the polytechnical schools will be working with those from the polytechnical schools, and international students will be working with each other. Again, uh, we as a university categorize those people a little bit, and of course they continue categorizing themselves. To illustrate this example, I put the uh, crest uh, in the upper side of the slide. Um, who recognizes it? Yes, tell me. Harry Potter. Harry Potter, what is it? Uh, it's a crest of Hogwarts, right? So, what do the animals represent? Harry Potter fans? Before House of the School, is littering. Sorry? Before House of the School, Gryffindor is littering. Exactly, four houses of the school. Uh, Gryffindor, Slytherin, uh, the Badger from Hufflepuff, and Ravenclaw. So, if you think about the social categorization, just try to recall how Gryffindors treat each other and how Gryffindor treats residents. So, once you are a member of the group, you are getting preferential treatment. So, this would mean that diversity should be detrimental, right? So, if you are different, we might be compartmentalizing ourselves and it will not good, be not good for our work. At the same time, there are other theories which say that diversity is better, should be, should be beneficial. For instance, it is known that diverse problem solvers tend to outperform high ability problem solvers. And again, it's not so surprising because if they are very different, then the resources we have are also very different. So if we work together, then you are getting access to my resources, I am getting to your access to your resources, and you have more. However, if you are very, very similar, then the resources we have are likely to be similar as well. And essentially, there is less to be gained by getting access to those resources. And finally, it is also known that multicultural so uh, social networks tend to promote creativity. So it's also related to different perspectives. So when we looked at this um, several years ago, we have specifically focused on gender diversity and on tenure diversity. And we have observed that both gender diversity and tenure diversity, so difference in experience, are positive for productivity. So teams that are more gender diverse are more productive than teams that are less gender diverse, teams which are more tenure diverse are more productive than teams that are less tenure diverse. At the same time, we have seen the positive relation between tenure diversity and turnover, and despite the word positive, this is actually bad news. So essentially this means that if you have a team with um, a big difference in uh, experience of their members, yes, they will produce a lot together, but people will leave. So this team will, is not sustainable in terms of time. Similar things have been observed for Wikipedia, for instance. And we do not see any of this <coughs> gender diversity. And other studies which are summarized in this uh, slides relate uh, gender to tenure, so duration to, uh, or to duration of engagement, I'm going to talk about it in a moment, as well as uh, gender diversity to uh, likelihood of suboptimal communication. We see that for instance gender diversity, uh, gender diverse teams are less likely to exhibit uh, suboptimal communication patterns such as black cloud and there is too much communication and we don't really know what is used and what is useless in communication and indirectly to presence of cold spells but I'll also talk a little bit about it in a moment so the work on relation between gender and uh, duration of engagement started by the following observation so this is a survival plot <coughs> How many of you have seen survival plots in the past? Good! So just for the benefit of those who have not seen it, um, the x-axis represents time in months, the y-axis represents percentage of those that are still, whatever. In our case, percentage of individuals that are still contributing to the project x months after their first contribution. 
So you see here uh, that uh, the curve corresponding to men is higher than the curve corresponding to women. So this means that uh, if on day zero we have 100% of our contributors, that after one year we will have roughly 70% of men who are still contributing to the same project, while for women the percentage will be lower, it will be roughly 60%. So we observed the fact that women disengage faster. So we wanted to understand why does it happen and how can we try to um, uh, help the situation. So we have looked at this uh, phenomenon through the lens of the social capital. So I'm not going to um, lecture you now about what kind of social capital are there and how it's all related to uh, differences between group dynamics. But roughly what we have found is that uh, it is beneficial for individuals to be involved in projects uh, that use uh, multiple programming languages. This is kind of expected in the sense that if you are diversifying your skills, you, might, you are more likely to continue the, your involvement in the project or in open source development. <coughs> because you are more um, employable, in a way, by different projects, you have different skills. Um, so, the plot in the lower part of the slide shows difference between um, survival likelihood of individuals uh, in that have this involvement in a highly diverse project in terms of programming languages and lower diversity. So you see that this difference is always positive, right? So it's always a good idea for contributors of any gender to be involved in projects uh, that employ different programming languages. What you do see further is that for long-term involvement, for involvement after 12 months, this involvement in projects with different programming languages is more beneficial for women than for men. This is a blue curve going higher than the orange curve. Okay. And another result I've already mentioned is this linkage of gender diversity, community smells, and cold smells. So for community, uh, here we see a closer look at this uh, study where we have uh, investigated uh, different community smells, different cold smells, and different gender-related variables. So for gender diversity, as I already said, more gender diverse teams are less likely to exhibit black cloud. So the situation where we cannot distinguish between useful and useless uh, communication. Uh, and indirectly less likely to lead to projects which have long methods because presence of um, black cloud has been shown to lead to um, uh, presence of long methods in the source code. At the same way, number of women rather than gender diversity is related to the radio silence effect. So radio silence effect uh, is a situation when we have two sub-communities within our community and we have one particular individual which interposes themselves in the communication between those two parts. Such that if this particular person does not want to transmit information to one of the other groups, then they achieve complete silence. So they can very uh, easily block communication. Um, so, if you have women in our group, then radio silence is less likely and radio silence has been related to block and so on. What's interesting here is that the number of women is an important variable and not gender diversity, which suggests that even when women are outnumbered, they can uh, contribute to improving communication in the team. Okay. So, given all this stuff, how do we actually do it? So, typically, uh, we combine two kinds of work. We perform a large-scale data analysis. Uh, large-scale, just to give you an impression, the recent study of social capital on GitHub has involved uh, roughly 30,000 uh, uh, GitHub contributors whom we identified as women, 30,000 contributors whom we identified as men, all their projects and all individuals who are contributing to those projects. 
Uh, and of course, we also like talking to people. Uh, so we conduct surveys, uh, we interview people, sometimes we ask them more targeted questions, such as vignettes and so on. But of course, the question would be how do you even measure or how do you even identify gender based on GitHub data? So before we are going further, I need to say that whatever technique we are using, manual or automatic, uh, we need to keep in mind two things. So first of all, gender is a complex social construct. And whatever we are doing is necessarily simplification. Second, um, gender is privacy sensitive. Uh, there are examples when contributors prefer not to disclose their gender Obvious example uh, would be uh, women preferring not to disclose their gender on platforms such as GitHub uh, because of safety concerns, but this is not the only one. We also need to keep in mind that, uh, that when we are working in, um, with larger projects or with companies, projects or companies might not be very eager to reveal gender composition of their teams because they might appear less, um, less gender diverse than they actually would like us to believe. Uh, so we've had a very positive experience with, for instance, OpenStack. OpenStack is a very open uh, project in this sense. Uh, and we had a gender uh, report there in collaboration with Petergia. Um, at the same time, uh, there are companies which, for instance, prefer to report general gender numbers without specifying distribution of genders to specific roles. So in a way, um, engineers are being put together with uh, sales people and so on, which of course masks differences. So if you look at uh, general guidelines on how to ask questions about gender, um, then of course we can consider going to um, this book, which is essentially a highly influential guide on questionnaire design uh, by um, Bradford and his co-authors. And um, I really would recommend you to use this uh, guide for all kinds of questions, but not for questions about gender. So in 2004, um, Bradford was recommended to ask about gender by using this question. And you already see that first of all, it conflates gender and sex by uh, referring to the word sex and not gender, and by referring to male female instead of women men. Uh, and of course, it also has only two options. However, <coughs> recent surveys of Stack Overflow and GitHub show that uh, roughly 0.7, 0.9% of respondents neither do not identify as women or men. And uh, of course, it doesn't appear much, right? It's less than 1%. But you need to keep in mind that it is twice as high as the US population in general. So non-binary individuals are more, seem to be more prevalent in software development than in population in general, at least in the population that has been surveyed by Stephen and Peter. So this is why a slightly better way to ask about gender would be to follow the uh, recommendations of Peter Bauer um, and suggest male, female, and then something else specified. So this is, of course, problematic in many ways over also. A um, technical problem would be that my favorite survey platform, Google Forms, does not support it. Google Forms only supports other as a third option where you can fill in an answer, and other people is not a good idea. Moreover, results obtained by using this item are not reliable. So here you see a uh, distribution of the answers, male, female, other, uh, as given by trans feminine and trans masculine respondents. So, just to remind you, uh, it's also on the slide trans feminine uh, contributors are those which have been assigned male at birth and identify as women or as non binary. And trans masculine, by the same token, have been assigned female at birth and identify as men or as gender non binary. Um, so, you see essentially that. All answers have been given by all groups of respondents. And again, what happened is that um, this question was not clear. It was not clear whether it was actually referring to sex as a sign of birth, which is suggested by items male, female, by answers male, female, or a gender identity. 
because it's kind of implicit in the context. When this item has been, when this question has been used in the interviews, it turned out that while cisgender individuals did not have any problem answering it, transgender individuals experienced this as taxi. As taxi. So ultimately, they tried to figure out the intention of the interviewer and reach different conclusions. So not a good idea. Uh, then of course there is a project called Open Demographics, which if you look carefully at this slide, you will see a whole bunch of answers uh, and several questions. So good news is that first of all, um, it separates being transgender or not being transgender from the question about the gender itself. Uh, it also has a separate item for women and men rather than for male and female. Uh, and it also allows you to check all that apply supporting the idea that a person can be a woman and a man, or a woman and a non-binary person at the same time. Bad news is that this list is, of course, enormous. And if you are trying to uh, run a survey of software developers, we want to keep our service short, and in particular, we want to keep the demographics part as short as possible, because we don't really study gender as a gender on its own. We want to study gender-related differences in software development. So we want to ask questions about software development. This should be small. Uh, furthermore, quite some of those categories, if you read carefully, might be experienced as tricky and confusing, uh, essentially threatening reliability of the results that you have. This is why a much better solution has been proposed by the HCI Guidelines for Gender Equity and Inclusivity, essentially asking open questions. Of course, open questions, as most of you probably know, uh, are more difficult to process, and more difficult to cope for us as researchers, as opposed to uh, binaries. But at the same time, uh, software engineering surveys are not that big, are probably talking about a hundred or a couple of hundreds of responses. Most of the answers we are going to get to this question will be anyhow uh, falling into the uh, two traditional genders. So the amount of manual correction which we need to uh, apply can be expected to be very limited. However, when we are, whatever technique we are using, uh, for surveys, uh, we need to keep in mind that the main issue is the response rate. Uh, Non-company based, so open source uh, service of open source contributors tend to achieve 10 to 20 percent response rate. This is low. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, in our recent study of social capital, right, we talked about. Um, something like 60,000 contributors we wanted to analyze. So if you want to get 60,000 answers through a survey, given this response rate, we need to ask at least 300,000 people. But if I am going to ask 300,000 GitHub contributors, and you are going to ask 300,000 GitHub contributors, and somebody else is going to ask 300,000 GitHub contributors, and essentially we are going to be spending those poor contributors continuously and they will be discouraged to answer it. And they essentially are not going to get anywhere. So, enter automatic gender detection techniques. So all those automatic gender detection techniques, whatever they might be, are based on those assumptions. The assumption is that the way we present ourselves, the way developers present themselves, in combination or in uh, with the artifacts they create, or any part of this, can be used to infer gender. This is a basic assumption. If you don't assume this, none of the automatic techniques is good for you. So the most popular group of this kind of um, automatic techniques can be classified as name to gender. And indeed, here you have a map of Europe uh, with uh, names that are popular among women, names that are popular among men. Uh, you probably can see that uh, the differences are, uh, well, the names are different, right? So if you get a name, you typically can uh, guess the gender. And in fact, this practice is well established. Uh, and in some countries, such as Belgium, where we are today, uh, they are even recorded in laws and administrative procedures. 
So the law in Belgium says that names should not be confusing. And many uh, local authorities essentially interpret this prohibition of confusion as no girls' names for boys, no boys' names for girls. So if you are choosing a name which is uh, unisex, you are required to give second, third, and so on names, which could be disambiguated. It's not a law, but an interpretation. <coughs> of course, whatever rules you might have in Belgium, you need to keep in mind that we have, uh, we are working in an international context. That's my favorite example. Uh, Andrea and uh, quite some uh, other names which would in Italy be associated with men, uh, might be associated with women in other countries. For instance, Andrea would be typically associated with men in Germany. So this is why uh, all kinds of tools such as gender computer, which was uh, Bolden's work from several years ago, uh, in addition to uh, the name, also take location into account as a proxy for uh, interpretation of the names. I am using my profiles not because I'm a paradigmatic software developer, but because it was very easy for me to obtain a consent to show this. <laughs> so, since this work on gender computer, quite some tools have been proposed which are trying to infer gender based on names. In 2016, we have run an uh, evaluation of those tools for four tools which have been available uh, at that time, and we have seen that essentially uh, no silver bullets were present for different data sets. We have used uh, different tools to perform better or worse. The only conclusion which we could infer more or less consistently was that adding information from additional data sources such as GitHub um, would be a good idea. So since there's more information you have, the better the results. Um, <coughs> another example. Andrea Kapiluki, who is living in London. What can you say about the gender of this individual? He's a man. Why? Because he's Italian. Because he's Italian, right? Because we know him. Because we know him. That's a nice argument, that's not the argument I want to hear. Because I can't operationalize your knowledge. Uh, so now SOAR is a tool which tries to reason more or less as the main value of this reason. He's Italian. So now SOAR, based on the surname, infers ethnic origins of an individual uh, and uses this information rather than location to interpret uh, the first name. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense because just looking around, quite some of us do not really live in countries where we have been born. So to accommodate for this, now sort tries to use surnames. So here you see that the gender inferred is M and the score is minus 0.5. So now sort um, uses minus 1 to indicate complete confidence that the individual is a man. 1 to indicate a complete confidence that the individual is a woman. Everything in between is lower degree of confidence. 0 simply means either the tool doesn't know anything. And minus 0.5 indicates this person is likely to be a man, but I'm sorry, it's not completely sure. So how far can we get with those tools? This is uh, step overflow data. Roughly 11% of the Stack Overflow users have automatically generated usernames like Google 12345, which are completely out of boundaries for any kind of tools. Of course, you cannot know how many names are there, how many non-name names are there, but roughly half of the remain, half of the names have at least one space in their names, suggesting first name, surname combination. Which is, of course, not necessarily true. I mean, if I call myself the greatest programmer on earth, I will have all the spaces you want, but it will not be really any. But there's a rough estimate. In the blue part of the ring, those are the names where Namsor can provide some kind of benefits. For the red part of the ring, only basic tools such as gender computer and so on can be applied. So this is only about when it comes to quality, uh, there was a recent study by Santa Maria and Yohanovic based on uh, authors of scientific papers. Uh, so they have applied several of those name to gender tools and evaluated them in terms of their behavior. So you see, for instance, the gender guesser tends to over-report unknowns. It tends to give up more often than other tools. While gender API and gender as I.O. Um, 
tend to overpredict men as women and women as men, right? They tend to err on certain cycles of bias. It's based on uh, seven sound names. So our now sort, which we looked at uh, on the previous slide, seems to perform quite reasonably. However, the close look reveals a completely different story. For European names, Namsor is doing great. Median is 1. So there's a sense for Namsor, 1 or minus 1, in this case, of course, they look at the absolute values, uh, means complete confidence of the tool in its results. Uh, even the first quartile is more than 95%. So for European names, they are fine. The situation with African names is not that great, but they are still doing well. At least for half of the names, we see complete confidence. Asia is a big, big problem. And if you look closer, we see that Eastern Asian names and Southeastern Asian names are really hard for Namsor to recognize. And this is a problem because the substantial amount of software developers are uh, South and East Asian, right? So East Asian is 6% according to the federal data, and South Asian is 12%. Moreover, this is a region which is growing fastest in terms of the numbers of software developers. So if you want this kind of tools to be uh, still relevant, we need to forget our European bias and try to go and consider other names. So this is why when we've been working on the social capital with Sophie Kuhn, um, Alex Nauta, Anita Brown, and Bogdan, uh, we have extended uh, the tools which we have already had, gender computer of Bogdan, and Nam Sora already talked about this data about uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean names uh, obtained either from name lists or from celebrity lists. And the tool we have received, so the performance we have received is summarized in the table. So you see that our tool outperforms other tools on all data sets. And uh, for instance, improvement for the Chinese names uh, is the most impressive one because we went up to 60% uh, as opposed to 18% uh, of the gender computer and 7% of Namsor. So we have provided this data to Namsor and Namsor is currently um, revising their machinery to uh, accommodate Chinese, Japanese, and Korean names in a better way. So another part of information that many software developers tend to disclose on such platforms <coughs> and stack overflow is a profile page. So this means that we can use uh, face um, recognition techniques to infer um, gender and uh, age in this particular case uh, of our contributors. So again, this is me, this is my picture which has been taken a couple of years ago. Um, so the gender is correctly identified, age has been a little bit off, I was not 38 back then. Um, so, but okay, we are, looking, we are mostly interested in gender. Unfortunately, things don't always go that smoothly. This is Daniela Petruzalek, who is known to, uh, who is a software developer, and she is a transgender woman. And you see that based on the picture I have chosen, uh, face data, which is exactly the same tool as before, sometimes it recognizes her as a man, sometimes it recognizes her as a woman. So we wanted to understand, so, you know, this can be done, but there is always a risk of misgendering. Of course, we also wanted to understand how far we can get with those techniques. Uh, in the same way as uh, we have uh, done for names on Stack Overflow, uh, I wanted to understand how many Stack Overflow contributors essentially show their faces. So for the others, <coughs> roughly 30% uh, use auto-generated profile images. So people tend to believe that uh, revealing their profile picture in any way, not necessarily with their face, is more revealing than their name. You might remember that we had only 11% of individuals who used automatically generated usernames. So for profile images, the percentage is high. But then we have selected, we have carefully selected 900 profiles from Stack Overflow uh, distributed over uh, different age groups and different reputation groups. Uh, and we have uh, clustered uh, the uh, profile image, those pictures, those avatars, uh, using 
classical card sorting techniques, and we have observed that roughly 53% of them correspond to faces. Again, I'm not claiming that those are faces of the developers themselves. It would have required quite a different argument, but at least those are faces are um, rather than, for instance, logos of their companies, cat pictures, uh, nerdy memes, and so on and so on. So, keeping this in mind, we can say that in roughly face recognition techniques can help us to identify gender of at most 35% of the contributors, right? 30% don't have, have other generated pictures and then half of the remaining ones. So the next group of techniques, and it will be the shortest one, uh, is based on uh, analyzing the artifacts that humans create. Uh, the idea here would be that if you are looking at writing in general, uh, women and men write in different ways. This is a recent overview uh, of um, the work by Stefan Kutia and Ben Herman uh, of um, gender identification techniques based on text. Uh, as you see, most of those uh, studies are focused on tweets, tweets in different languages. The best performance has been achieved by tools of company in order, which essentially has been designed for authorship identification. So if you are a literature critic uh, and you are doubting uh, whether Shakespeare actually wrote uh, his plays himself and who on earth is Elena Ferrante, uh, then you can use this kind of techniques to try to attribute the authorship. And this is an interesting uh, perspective from our perspective as well, because there is quite some work on authorship identification for source code as well. Would, be this, would this be the way to go? Would this suggest that uh, women and men code differently? And how on earth we are going to deal with collaborative texts or actually code which has been created by multiple individuals of different genders? In any case, we need to keep in mind that first of all, accuracy of those techniques is limited. So Kruger and Herman show for different data sets between 60 to 90, 3%. Uh, Sophie Chu has uh, reported 1684 again for different uh, kinds of names. So accuracy can be even lower for some particular subgroups. For instance, we had 60% for Chinese names, right? So we have groups of artifacts, of groups of profiles, groups of people whose gender is more difficult to find. Another problem is the issue of reliability. As already said, when we look at images, we don't really know whose faces are they, even if he knows that they are faces. This is a quote from one of our earlier studies where we have a contributor who has created a fake GitHub handle such that people would assume that uh, she was male because her original GitHub handle revealed her gender through her name. And finally, all those techniques tend to assume gender bias. So in the survey of Kruger and Herman, all those techniques assume gender binary. Uh, OSCAS has reported that uh, more than 90 percent of facial recognition techniques assume gender binary. And in the survey of Santa Maria and Mihalievich, well, 20 percent here simply means one out of five tools means gender binary. It does not mean that some that those name recognition techniques are somehow more aware of non-binary individuals, it simply means that those tools typically report confidence in the same way as NumSor reported it, and it produces a kind of scale of values rather than just two ones. So whatever technique we are using, whether we are using uh, server-based techniques uh, where we are asking questions or uh, automated techniques, we need to keep in mind that uh, all those techniques have their limitations and choices of techniques should depend on your RQ, on your purpose. So essentially, if you are looking at individual um, behavior, then misgendering this individual is very problematic. If, however, you are talking about large populations, then as long as your gender identification technique is not introduces too much bias, you might be somehow able to compensate for it, for instance, your subsequent statistical analysis. 
So I would like to close this uh, talk by uh, calling for action and reporting first steps on a specific kind of work we've been doing. Um, so what I would like to encourage you to do is two things. First of all, think about uh, gender beyond the binary. And second, to think about gender in combination with other variables, such as age, culture, and so on. For instance, there's a recent study of um, Finnish women considering transition to IT, career traditional IT, uh, and among the concerns which have been voiced by uh, study participants, quite some were related to combination gender age. I am 36, I've been offered an opportunity to follow a course on uh, IT, which will take me two years. Who wants a, software, a woman who is a software developer with no experience, age 38? Right? So you have this combination of gender, age, and experience like a role as being voiced by one of the participants. So those kind of narratives are important to be heard. So what have we done as a preliminary work? It was a workshop paper this year. We have interviewed uh, three uh, transgender women who are software engineers. And we talked about uh, their identity management. We talked about concerns related to online safety and so on. So we have reviewed those recordings and compared the scenes which emerged. And then we have cross-checked those scenes with uh, blogs of uh, additional software developers who are transgender women. Uh, we have created the first version of our paper and the performed member check. So essentially we have asked yet another person who is a transgender woman, who is a software developer, to check on correctness of our findings. So the first topic which emerged was essentially control of identity disclosure. Um, you see here, this, on the left-hand side, you see a quote from one of our interviews. Um, and uh, essentially, Stack Overflow allows you much more flexibility in what part of your identity do you disclose. GitHub used to be much more rigid in this way. GitHub used to require you to disclose your email address, and not only to disclose it to GitHub itself, but to the entire world. If your, GitHub, if your email address reveals your gender, you are actually revealing your gender to the entire world. Um, this might be highly problematic. And it's not only identity goal, so this desire to be seen as presented is not only identity goal, as uh, uh, so here's a quote from Daniela Petrozada, who already mentioned, stresses that it's also a means of self preservation because transgender individuals are still commonly targeted by hate speech, doxing, and all other kind of inappropriate online behavior. Another issue here is that um, online platforms allow transgender individuals to have economically stable work. So this is a um, bounty source, uh, which is an online community of roughly 60,000 participants, where they are the performing software development tasks and earn rewards. They earn money by performing software development tasks. Um, so why is this so important for our respondents? You need to keep in mind that um, uh, the figures from the 2015 US uh, transgender survey are mind-boggling. So if you think about rates of unemployment, then it is roughly 15% for transgender individuals as opposed to 5% for cisgender individuals. Uh, if you talk about poverty, 29% opposed to 12. And if you talk about homelessness, 12% as opposed to 0. 0.2. So for all those uh, economic measures, transgenders are much higher, so much worse than cisgender individuals. So this means that uh, the importance of economically stable work is important, is crucial for them. And the reason why it works is because those platforms allow one to distance technical contribution from identity. Uh, again, quote, um, you cannot tell from my technical profile that I'm transgender, it doesn't make a big deal. Preservation of anonymity helps to perform, to survive, essentially. Another quote comes from uh, Ross, who is also a uh, transgender woman who is a software developer who essentially learned, taught herself 
software development by watching YouTube videos. Something which you would not have been able to do by attending regular classes. So, looking at those uh, topics which emerge from uh, our work, uh, it seems that the reason why uh, those concerns by software development on those online platforms allows our respondents to, uh, to uh, achieve their goals is because of the remote work. So, of course, remote work is not limited to uh, things like bound to source. Uh, some companies, such as GitHub, for instance, report that up to 60% of their employees work remotely, part-time or full-time. Um, and in particular, we think that uh, remote work can be beneficial for much broader community than specific uh, community we have studied. So it can not only be beneficial for one marginalized community, but for any marginalized community. And to illustrate this point, I would like to use an example which I have borrowed from Margaret Burnett from Oregon State. So, I guess that you recognize this, right? This is a pavement with a special kind of um, configuration which would allow people in wheelchairs to uh, safely cross the road. So, this is a technological solution which has been created with one particular community in mind, people in wheelchairs. But of course, the very same technological solution can benefit different groups. People who have kids, and those people who have strollers, <coughs> luggage, trikes, and so on and so forth. So in the same way, we expect remote uh, work to be beneficial not only for transgender women, but also for people who, for whatever reasons, uh, do not feel accepted in the software development. So to summarize, we have, uh, I have started by um, showing some of our recent results on interplay of gender and software development related to uh, community smells, code smells, um, social capital and whatnot. In the second part of the talk, uh, I focused on techniques uh, which one can use to infer gender either by asking people or by uh, applying to all some kind of algorithms. Whatever techniques we use, please keep in mind that gender is privacy sensitive and any kind of technique you might be using uh, is prone to errors and prone to um, privacy concerns. And finally, uh, I have uh, briefly discussed the very, very first step we have made in order to hear the stories of transgender individuals uh, involved in software development and the conclusion which we derived essentially that remote work seems to be the empowering mechanism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Can you have some questions? Of course. Sure, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so, as you mentioned, some of the um, uh, so phrases uh, like anonymity helps to survive, gender is privacy sensitive. So I was wondering uh, so if we are doing um, so triple mining and we are doing social analysis, then often we infer information about the persons who use lots of tools for so, this. So how should we go about um, so if we want so sometimes we want to know about uh, gender, for example, because we, we want to measure diversity or whether this is beneficial. On the other hand, by doing so, we might reveal uh, somehow the uh, or uh, this uh, undisclosed uh, the things that are supposed to, to be left uh, anonymous. Uh, so there is a very delicate balance. Uh, so it's absolutely it true. Do? It's absolutely true. Pri it's privacy sensitive, right? So the question is how to deal with. Well, first of all, you are never supposed to be doing at the level of an individual. So you never report gender of this person, right? You're always aggregating it. But of course not every aggregation is safe. I mean if uh, you know if you have five people you know that one of them is one is a woman and uh, you just say a woman says and we all know which which person it is, right? Um, you need to think about uh, advantages and disadvantages of this for the community you are studying. This is why membership is 
very important. So essentially giving it back to the community and hearing what the community thinks about it. We usually don't do it, and I think it's a shortcoming of our work. So we've done it for the first time in this uh, last study of transgender individuals. We actually asked them to look at what they could do, uh, whether they agree with those results. Um, another issue here is when you are thinking about privacy, right? Um, we will talk this, and we'll have a talk this afternoon about mining repositories in the context of GDPR, right? So this is exactly that. Yeah. Um, what can be stored, what cannot be stored, and so on. And the last point is that so far, what we have been doing, we have been imitating human behavior. Um, in a sense that if, so gender is known to be set up, right? So if you are looking at software development teams on GitHub, then the most visible attribute of team members is their technical proficiency according to one of our previous surveys. But the second most visible one is gender. So contributors know gender of gender, or at least they think they know. So whatever our tools are doing, they are not revealing information that humans would not have had without us. What we are doing, we are scaling it up. This might be problematic because of course I cannot I'm sorry, I cannot label 60,000 uh, names and put overall gender, but the tool can do it easily. So this is a concern, right? We are scaling it up. Uh, but at the same time, we are not doing anything which human beings would not be doing anyhow. You might come back to the discussion of... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, and this is why I'm actually very happy that Jesus has chosen this topic, so I'm extremely curious to hear what you have to tell. We have some more questions, but we don't know, maybe by now there is other uh, people that have questions. So, uh, another question, I this was about the. Um, so, we had, <laughs> in the beginning, you said uh, some of your first slides, you um, showed gender diversity and the new diversity. And then for the new diversity, uh, if I'm yeah, it's still there, right? right? It is uh, if it there is a team which is more the new diversity, then yeah, that's it's uh -huh. more likely, uh, more, more likely that people will uh, leave because of yes. it. So, is there any reason why this is uh, the case? What is uh, um. We specifically we didn't look at the reasoning there, but uh, the comparable study from Git, uh, sorry, from Wikipedia shows that uh, more experienced editors are simply fed up with those newbies. So either newbies are practices, either newbies are um, leaving because they are getting cold showers from the experienced editors, or experienced editors are leaving because um, you know they cannot they are fed up with to uh, playing uh, tutor for the kids. Um, what I did not tell is that there is a mediating effect. This means that if, uh, so, and this, the mediator is a median experience, median data. Mm -hmm. So if you have this diversity, but in general, your people are quite experienced, so the gap is big, but the kind of median experience is high, then this tenure phenomenon becomes weaker. So, this, a phenomenon is very prominent if you have a situation with low median tenure. So essentially, if you have lots and lots of people who are not experienced, and a couple of those who are experienced. Mm -hmm. So basically, it means that the distribution of your data should so have a specific form? For so, there is a more, so the relation is more fine-grained than what I was presenting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, um, another, so you mentioned different types of uh, diversity, including gender diversity, including gender diversity, yeah. you talked about language diversity. Mm -hmm. Are there any other types of diversity that you think would be beneficial for uh, for team interaction in the context of software development and emotional Well, um, that's a good question, right? So, as I said, we are looking currently at age diversity. Uh, and age in particular, because I mean, software developers seem to disappear after a certain age, according to some sources. What happens to them? Um, it's essentially we need to understand what we are looking for. The more diverse people 
are, the more likely they have to have conflicts. But conflicts are not necessarily problematic. What can be problematic? So the issue is not not having conflicts. The issue is having means of successfully resolving them. Uh, literature of conflicts essentially says that uh, task conflicts are beneficial. So it's beneficial for us to have different opinions on the same topic. Process conflicts are more problematic, but relationship conflicts are the most problematic of them all. Because this essentially means that we cannot work together on any topic. So we need to provide um, means for developers to identify those conflicts and to resolve them. And then we can see how it plays its diversity. Any more questions? I finished mine. Okay, and uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again. <laughs>